Hello, my name is Claire Jinks and I lead the qualitative work stream in the NIHR incubator for methodology. In this webinar today, you'll hear from Professor Dawn Tier, who's the chair of the methodology incubator, and will give us a brief overview of what the overall aims of the incubator are. I will then briefly outline the aims and objectives of the qualitative work stream in the incubator and give you some examples of some of our activity. We will then have three short talks followed by a Q&A um, with our panel and that will last for about 30 minutes. So I'm now going to hand straight over to Dawn, who is Professor of Biostatistics at Newcastle University and who is the Chair of the Methodology Incubator. Over to you, Dawn. Thanks very much um, for that introduction, um, Claire. I'm, I'm really, really delighted to be at this event um, today. Um, it's really great to have this quali qualitative researchers work stream launched and um, I've just got a few slides here to tell you a bit more about the incubator and the other activities that the incubator does. So as Claire said, I am the, the chair of the um, methodology incubator and I also have another role um, as co-leading the NIHR statistics group. Um, the, the methodology incubator is one of 10 incubators that has been launched by the NIHR to provide a focus where there's a recognized um, issue with research capacity. These incubators are research, uh, are careers fo uh, focused initiatives, which allow uh, a bespoke community driven approach. So all of the incubators are, are really very different. And the first role of, of the incubator is to bring together the stakeholders and partners to form the foundation for building identifiable communities. The incubator was actually formed from four distinct proposals for methodology incubators to the NIHR. And um, early on, we agreed to have a very broad definition of an NIHR methodologist to be as inclusive as possible for where we felt there were real capacity issues. Um, and we wanted a definition so that we could be clear who the incubator was for. And we felt a broad definition, such as this one, was preferable to a definitive list so we could really be inclusive. Um, which is very important as many methodologists have trained via interesting or, or non-standard routes. So our, our broad definition of an NIHR methodologist um, is people who develop and apply procedures, tools and techniques for gathering, accessing, analyzing and interpreting data in health, public health and social care research. And to illustrate this, we list um, examples of disciplines the incubator includes. But don't worry if your specialism is not listed here. If you feel uh, you can identify with the definition, then that's all we need from you. So the incubator is about, about careers. We're seeking to increase capacity by attracting, retaining and rewarding people in methodological research. An important emphasis of the incubator is to both increase opportunities and raise awareness for methodologists to do their own research and to be able to secure funding towards it. As an incubator, we have a modest resource, it's fair to say, which helps us run events such as this and develop a website to raise awareness and promote our activities. The website is um, very close to being ready for launch. However, our main impact really is to feed back to the NIHR and make recommendations to them on how to achieve our aims. So we currently, the incubator, we are one of the larger incubators. We've got eight work streams. Um, four of these are discipline focused, led by particular uh, groups. The statistics and economics work, work streams grew from two of the original incubator proposals. The qualitative research stream you're going to hear all about today. Um, our newest work stream is the information and retrieval specialists, and they are planning uh, an event um, in the next few months. And the, 
the, the last two on the list are application focused work streams that work that also grew from two original incubator proposals. So the last two really are looking at the practical challenges of growing research capacity in emerging uh, research areas where there's a high demand. So since our formation, we've run a number of awareness raising events and have run a, a successful pilot intern scheme. We have more proposals in the pipeline and in the upcoming year, we'll be looking to put in a renewal for the incubator so that we can extend our activities, especially the maintenance of these sort of growing communities that, that we're forming. Um, so I hope that's given you a little bit of background about the incubator. Um, it's going to be great to hear from you all today about what your, your uh, visions for the qualitative research stream should be or could be. And uh, thank you for your time. And I'll hand back over to Claire. Thank you, Dawn. Um, if you could put the next slide up, please. Thank you. So the, this is our overall aim of the qualitative work stream. So we want to um, support research capacity development, support the careers of qualitative methodologists, and this is also including those who have an interest in mixed methods. So we're going to be focusing our activities to work towards the ambitions of the incubator that Dawn has just highlighted. And I'll just, uh, I'll just repeat those. So it's really activities related to how we can attract people into rewarding qualitative research careers how we can retain qualitative methodologists in health and social care research, how we can support training and development pathway for methodologists. But importantly, also, we want to work with the NIHR infrastructure and funding bodies so that we can develop increased opportunities and awareness for methodologists to apply for funding for methodological research. Next slide, please, Dawn. Thank you. So we were one of the later work streams to be established. So um, a group of us came together um, in about March, April time last year, and we've um, had a good response, great response. We've now got 21 work stream members um, and we're supported by the, uh, the incubator team. Um, and um, so this, this, is, this is a group of, uh, of our work stream members who are working behind the scenes to help activities like today um, uh, come, come into fruition. Next slide, please, Dawn. And this just uh, gives you a flavour of some of our, uh, the faces behind those names, um, brings our work stream members to life. Thank you, Dawn. So this slide shows the objectives of the qualitative work stream. These are our main objectives. We want to help build a network of qualitative researchers because we think that's really important in supporting careers. And I'll mention that uh, on the next slide. We want to work with ongoing partnerships to support qualitative research careers and we know um, you, you, you will be in touch with organisations and networks and initiatives um, that's relevant to your work. We don't want to duplicate activity but we want to work together with ongoing initiatives to see how we can best support and foster um, methodology uh, careers. We want to help to identify the challenges for qualitative researchers when developing careers and hopefully identify uh, possible solutions to these challenges that we face. And one way of doing this might, might be to raise awareness of the value of qualitative research. We also want to promote development and innovation in qualitative research. And one way of doing this also is to raise awareness of career development and funding opportunities. So as a work stream, we've been discussing ideas for activity that is linked to these objectives, but we really do wanna hear from you, our community, about what you think will help support careers and support develop research capacity uh, in qualitative methodology. And you can do that, you can have a say in two ways. Um, so today, after we've heard from the speakers later on in the webinar, we're going to launch a poll, which is just a single question, um, and it contains options um, for possible future activity that you would like to see our work stream um, focus on in the next 12 months. So you can have your say in, in, uh, in outlining what you think would be helpful to you. The second way is you can provide feedback to us on the webinar content today and your career development needs by completing uh, the evaluation form um, after the event. We really do want to hear from you and as Dawn said, incubators are about developing and starting communities and we want to focus our activities on what's important for you. Thanks Dawn, next slide please. 
So one of our objectives is to raise awareness of career development and funding opportunities for qualitative researchers and mixed methodologists. And this slide gives two examples that may be of interest to you. And we'll provide the links to these uh, funding streams in the chat um, later on before the end of the session. On the left hand side, you'll see uh, the NIHR pre-doctoral fellowship scheme. And this has recently launched in the last couple of weeks and it, I think it closes on the 17th of March. So another six or so weeks that this call is open. And these awards are designed to support people who are looking to start a career in, in health research and methodology. This scheme isn't open to clinicians who have access to other NIHR schemes. So this is a really good scheme for qualitative and mixed methodologists. And to be eligible, you must have completed a relevant first degree and have a host who is a higher education institute or, or an NHS body or another provider of health and social care. Um, and so please do share this information with, with any students and with colleagues that you think it's appropriate. Applicants can do a, a master's, for example, if they haven't got a master's, or if they have a master's, they can work towards developing a PhD. So it really is focused at this, at this early phase of attracting people into methodology careers. On the right side of the screen, you'll see um, the uh, Better Methods for Better Research funding stream, which um, the Medical Research Council, the MRC, is working with the NIHR, have recently launched this scheme to fund research to improve research methods. Um, there are two opportunities a year to submit to this scheme, BMBR, so you can submit in June and November each year. And last year there was a call which is relevant to us, which was about understanding remote approaches to qualitative health research, because this was recognised as a, as a strategic priority area, which was really good. There's another way that you can apply to this scheme um, through what's called their guidance development call. And this provides up to £60,000 for the development of guidance for methodological issues. And this is an annual call. Uh, there will be a call coming up in June this year. And so the question for us um, is what, what methodological issues are there in qualitative and mixed methods research where guidance would help solve this issue? And if you have thoughts about that, um, then this scheme uh, could be relevant for you. So these are two examples of relevant funding schemes for qualitative and mixed methods researchers. Um, the Methodology Incubator did host an event last year working together with um, the BMBR scheme to raise awareness about the scheme, it's relatively new, um, and the Incubator's website will be up and running soon as Dawn has mentioned, and so we can post the recording of that event there which will give you more information about, about the scheme. Some of the other work streams in the Incubator have also hosted events dedicated to uh, funding so, for example, statisticians and health economists as principal investigators. And those events have enabled methodologists to hear directly from the funders about the remit of their schemes, what makes a good application. So you can tell us again if this is something that you think would be useful for qualitative and mixed methodologists in the poll that's coming up shortly. Thank you, Dawn. One of our objectives is to help build a network for qualitative researchers, and we think this is really important for supporting careers. It helps with relationship building, it helps with employment opportunities by developing research collaborations, and through this as well it helps to spark discussion about methodological innovation. So we're really keen to support uh, networks for qualitative and mixed methods researchers. What you can see on this slide is um, an example from another of the incubators, the NIHR Mental Health Incubator, and they've developed this mental health research map. It's got over 500 people plotted on it, and its aim is to connect people to support collaborations um, and to, to provide networking opportunities. In our work stream, we've been discussing that we think that this could be something that's useful for our community, and we want to hear from you um, if you would like the work stream to focus on networking activities and developing a map um, which would be similar to this. Thank you, Dawn. I wanted to tell you briefly before I end about um, some of the cross work stream activity that we're doing in the methodology incubator. So members of our team are linked in with some of the other work streams and supporting work that they're doing. So Evie is a member of the internships and training scheme and Dawn briefly mentioned that last year they piloted a methodology internship scheme to promote careers to undergraduates. And the scheme ran last year over the summer last year 
Um, 11 interns were awarded to undergraduates to work in seven universities. Dr. Rebecca Barnes, who's a member of our work stream, was successful in getting one of the two qualitative internships. And Narik, the intern, has written a really nice piece about his experiences, about how this has benefited him, how it appealed to him between his undergraduate degree and his master's degree, and how this, this opportunity has really benefited him and developed his skills. There are other internships available um, through the NIHR. Um, for example, ones that I uh, know of are linked to the schools for primary care research, the schools for public health research, and the schools for social care research. The School for Primary Care Research, for example, has a similar internship, previously was only available to medical students, but has been um, expanded this year to allow eligibility for any undergraduate in any discipline to apply for internship with one of the nine member departments in the school. So it's really fantastic that that's um, been broadened out and is now available to methodologists as well. Jenny's leading uh, the health data science work stream, and this work stream is really focusing on um, developing uh, uh, trained investigators to really understand the potential of routing data, but also that's um, uh, informed by really rigorous and up-to-date appreciation of ethical, social, legal issues around using routing data and how that really can help expand um, uh, inclusivity in, in research that we do. So we've started conversations with that work stream about doing some work around perceptions of consent in relation to the use of routing data. I'm also a member of the Raising Awareness work stream, which aims to really showcase careers in methodology, identify uh, barriers and, and opportunities for developing careers as, as methodologists. And this work stream is developing a pilot careers event with the University of Birmingham uh, Career Service. So they've developed a, a virtual event targeting students through university careers. Um, and this is going to include things like a day in the life of a methodologist, impact of research, case studies, for example. So again, targeted at that uh, ambition of really attracting people into methodology careers. And if you've got an interest or experience in this kind of activity and you want to help um, the activities of our work stream, you can get in touch with us, leave your email in the evaluation form after the session, and we can invite you to join the work stream. So Dawn has given you um, just a brief introduction to what the incubator is. I've given you an introduction to the aims of our qualitative uh, work stream and just some examples of some of the activity that we've been involved with up till now and what we would like to do um, and get your feedback on. So we're now going to move into the three short talks. So um, our first speaker is um, Dr. Amy Russell. Amy is a senior research fellow from the University of Leeds, and I'm delighted to invite her to uh, give her presentation about how she's navigated her career as a methodologist. Thank you, and over to you, Amy. Thanks very much, Claire, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'll um, share my screen and go through my slides, if that's all right with everybody. Feels a little daunting to be um, representing a career in qualitative methodologies when I know that there are so many wonderful people that I work with every day who um, who also have qualitative methodology careers. But I'll give you an insight into how minds panned out and what we can learn from it because I think some of it will resonate with people. So my career is purely academic in background, moving from religious studies to sociology, and. Um, Sorry, trying to move my boxes around and being very unsuccessful. And it's a non-traditional move in terms of a lot of what I see um, in terms of applications going to the NIHR. The background beginning in humanities and then sociology, I was in the Centre for Interdisciplinary Gender Studies. And then I decided to move into applied health research. And this has given me a strong and rigorous background in qualitative methods and a confidence in the application of these methods, but also a willingness to be open to methodological innovation. And I say annoying things to my PhD students, like you can trust your gut when your themes are ready. And they just go, no, that's not how it works. And, um, and I think a lot of what we do in religious studies is asking those questions about saturation and about the kind of rigor and robustness of methodological themes 
but in a slightly different way and with a slightly different language. And, um, and so I think when I come to apply it to health research, I feel a lot more confident in some settings working with those methods. And I did, when I began, have to defend that approach, but I think I've got quite good at that now. So you would think this background and expertise in a variety of disciplines would be a wonderful credential, opening many, many doors. Everybody talks about the value of interdisciplinarity, but this is academia. We are discipline focused and you'd be wrong. In actual fact, I'm always asked what a common thread is through my research, what my thing is. And, um, and when people ask me for that common thread, they are talking a topic area and more often than not a clinical topic area. So I have to rethink how I tell my narrative of the grants that I've worked on and been awarded in a cohesive way. And I, even though we're talking about methods, I try and tell it through those themes, through health inequalities, through an understanding of marginalized communities and their access and outcomes from health services. And while that feels sometimes counterintuitive when we're trying to make a case for methods, how do people know to contact me to put me on a grant or to write a paper with me? Do people ever think, oh, I need somebody who's done a really good ethnography in primary care. I'll get Amy in. Or do they think we know somebody, we want somebody who works on intellectual disabilities who does that? And I can tell you, I've never been contacted because of my amazing ethnography skills in primary care, because I think people don't see that as something they need to go out of their um, departments for or out of the institutions for. But I have been brought into things because of my expertise on intellectual disabilities. So this is how we work, how we network. And we have this issue in not recognizing the, um, the qualitative skills of people. So this jack of all trades and a master of none is a genuine quote from a job interview I went for. And when I got told this, it was definitely replied as you don't have a theme area. And I didn't think to say I am a strong qualitative methodologist and to defend that. And now I ask why not? But actually, I don't think it would have made an impression on that person. Um, I don't think they would have been very impressed or seen it as expertise. And, um, and I don't think I could have articulated a case for the versatility of what I did. Um, I don't think they would have really recognized the value of that at the time. But if you look at what I do, there is a clear thread here. And it is one of qualitative expertise applied to different contexts, granted, mostly primary care contexts, although I started off with an ethnography in Sierra Leone, I worked on human trafficking, you know, all these different contexts, but the methods and the quality of the methods remain the same. And actually, as you see my career develop, you see I innovate a bit more, I get a greater focus on co-production and, um, and start thinking about the slightly more maybe um, controversial methods of something like autoethnography. And it comes with confidence to, um, to be doing those things and to be working not just on the kinds of methods that will get you the grant funding, which are easy to complete. And I say easy, but you know, that people understand when they look at a grant application. And I have to say for every successful grant I've listed on here, there are three more that didn't get funded. And the pressure of keeping three irons in the fire, three grants under submission so that I have a job in the hope that one gets funded so I can keep employed is a constant struggle. So this nice little table, I did originally make you a table of um, all the things I'd applied for and then I was gonna strike through all the ones that I didn't get, but I thought that was far too depressing and actually making that table was a bit um, too depressing for me. So I'm doing it this way to show you the common thread of methodology throughout my career. And these grants do represent me trying to tell a cohesive and themed narrative, but often you've got to go where the work is. And there's no shame in that. Um, when you're a research fellow, you take jobs as they come along and, um, and that's reasonable. And we should actually see that as improving your methods, improving your um, knowledge base, and not as something that you should try and disguise when you tell a research narrative. So there are challenges in the work, as I've alluded to, and I'll detail a bit more, but there are also um, opportunities, which I will get onto. 
but really I want to draw attention to our research culture and the Wellcome Trust has recently done a piece of work on research culture in higher education and they questioned that the research culture that we have now creates barriers for an open and honest environment where we can share mistakes, we can reflect on them for collective scrutiny and we can actually change the way we're going about things, improve our methods based on that. And instead, a lot of us work in silos. And if there's a mistake, we try to repair it and move on because of the time pressure we're on with research. A lot of the time, the grants are running out and you just need to deliver on them. So we've had challenges in terms of short term contracts. Certainly one of the biggest challenges in my career is fixed term contracts. I've seen grants where the researcher arrives on day one of data collection and they leave on the final day of data collection. And you have to ask what benefit that person gets in their career. And I know that when you're grant writing and the budget goes over budget, you tend to cut back on the researcher time, but we have to think about sustainable careers for those researchers. They're often the first to be cut and that's because we're not valuing them enough. And the expectation is always that you write up the previous grant when you're working on the next one, but you're also bidding for the next one when you're delivering the first one and you've got all this layered work and pressure upon you, you're not likely to be doing really high quality stuff. And so I include this quote by Clegg because it reminds me that the outputs of research dictate the success and it's quicker to get outputs if you stick to tried and tested methods. And the re no reviewer can discredit a method that everybody does and a thematic analysis um, where you cite Vaughan and Clark. So why risk your grant being rejected or not published if by trying to innovate, if you know what will get you through the process, will get you employment? And that does stifle innovation. So when I talk about fixed term contracts, I mean multiple short-term contracts that cause stress and job insecurity. And this timeline, although it might be a little difficult to have a look at, it illustrates 12 years of my life and each dot, except for the ones that say baby on them, are a, is a separate contract. Some of them lasted, the best longest one lasted three years. The shortest one was about a month. And I hopped between multiple contracts and at each intersection, sometimes I didn't know what was coming next. And it was a really pressured time, especially after baby two had arrived. Suddenly the weight of responsibility to um, be earning a living gets a little bit more pressured and you need to know where the money's coming from. And so I wouldn't have said that that was a good time to innovate for me. And, um, and I'm very lucky that there are contracts there that say, um, Research Capacity Funding, RCF, or Academic Development Fund, which is part of Athena Swan at our university. But these multiple contracts, trying to keep this career going has taken its toll on me in terms of burnout and in terms of me questioning the development of my methods. And I don't think it has to be this way. So in terms of opportunities, I do want to draw attention to Athena Swan and the Academic Development Fund. Um, it's something that the University of Leeds Faculty of Medicine and Health um, created and it enables academic staff to maintain their academic tra trajectory um, after a period of parental, maternity or adoption leave and you buy out some of your time to kind of repair your CV from the damage that the, that period of leave has done. So it bought me time to write up and publish my work when I didn't have the time to do it while finishing a grant. Um, and I mentioned Athena Swan as well, because it's no coincidence, as uh, Mary pointed out in the chat, that we are a panel of women talking about an inequality of esteem in our discipline. And my career has benefited from Athena Swan and the proactive action that the University of Leeds has taken. But we need to be open about the need for concrete action to address gender inequality in the academy and in relation to the status of qualitative methods. And then moving on to the Trials Methodology Research Partnership, it's been a wonderful space for me during my Wellcome Trust Fellowship where I can explore innovation and methods in a trial setting and network across the UK with others who are working in the same field. And Katie Gillies has kindly said that if you want to know more about that, you can contact her. 
research capacity funding has been a huge part of my career and it has bridged me over and over again. It's built links with the local NHS trusts. But the one thing I would say, while it's been invaluable, is it is limited on what it can fund. And I think one way to create that pilot information and generate data for larger grants is expanding what RCF can fund. And a lot of researchers don't know about it. And it's something that we really need to shout about because it's wonderful and it's saved my career many times. Equally, an evidence into practice grant from the Health Foundation taught me so much about the dissemination and implementation of research and how to get what we find in research out into the public and out into clinical practice. And if we hadn't have had that grant, we wouldn't have had 18,000 downloads on some of the information we produced from our um, NIHR HTA grant. If we hadn't teamed up with Diabetes UK to forge those links and get our information out there. And it's a valuable skill set that we don't invest in. And yet, you know, dissemination, uptake of our research, all really important topics. And then finally, a supportive team. I've been incredibly lucky to be on a team with Alan House and Louise Bryant, who have supported my career throughout, but they've given me the space in research contracts to write for the next grant and to be part of large bids. And without that, I don't think we would be having me here to call it a success. I really think it's about having a good team around you. So what do we need now to finish up? Um, we need sustainable funding that supports methodological innovation. And if it needs to be ring fenced, then so be it. And we need expert qualitative reviewers, people who understand qualitative work and don't get frightened by innovation or by ideas that will develop as the data comes in, people who can tolerate the, insert, the uncertainty that sometimes qualitative methods need to be really based in the findings. And we need methodologists as PIs. If we can't change the metrics we're measured by, then we need to change the way success is recognized. And we need sustainable fellowships. We need fellowships that don't end after three years, just as you start to develop your network and you start thinking about the next grant. Welcome has just moved to a model of five to seven years for its fellowships to try and build teams in universities. And it saw that three year fellowships were really acting as a sticking plaster for a larger problem of career sustainability. And we need to think about how we can make our fellowships and grants more sustainable to develop careers as part of them. And finally, we need networks of qualitative scholars that can share their innovation and support each other and represent, recognize our mutual expertise working together. Because if we have sustainable contracts and we have these grants, then we can pay it forward by supporting others. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Amy, for your really fantastic talk. You've raised some really, really important issues there and you've talked about research culture, you've talked about sustaining careers, you've talked about managing multiple lines in the fire, um, you've talked about um, 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 managing research capacity funding and opportunities that are there for people. So there might be things that people have questions around that. Please do put them in the Q&A and we can come to them um, in the Q&A session. Thank you, Amy, for a fantastic talk. OK, we'll now move on to the second speaker, uh, Professor Angel Chater, who's Professor in Health Psychology and Behaviour Change at the University of Bedfordshire. And she's also an associate of the uh, UCL um, Centre for Behaviour Change. So welcome, Amy, and uh, can I invite you to share your screen? Thank you. OK, thank you for um, inviting me to speak at this event today. Um, I was asked to speak about supporting careers um, of qualitative and mixed methods researchers. Um, and so hopefully I'll give you a bit of an overview of how I've done that over the course of, um, of my career. So just a bit of background about me. Um, I'm a health psychologist by training and with that, um, very much engaged in mixed methods methodologies. So um, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. And I draw from a biopsychosocial approach and predominantly working in the area of behaviour change for population health and wellbeing. 
And many years ago, I was asked what my unique selling point was. Um, and I, I get like um, Amy previously, didn't automatically think it was my methodologist um, approaches. Um, for me, it's around intervention, design, delivery, evaluation and adoption systems. Predominantly, the area that I work in is around the behaviour change wheel and using um, something called the COMB, which looks at people's capability, opportunity and motivation to perform behaviour. And a lot of the research that I do is around qualitative COMB diagnoses. So um, this is doing um, often a needs assessment of what might be preventing people from engaging in behaviour based on these capability, opportunity and motivational factors. And then how can we take that information and then build interventions um, effectively? So I'm often brought onto teams to assist with qualitative needs assessment or qualitative um, evaluation using this model, which um, has been developed by Susan Mickey and her team at um, University College London Centre for Behaviour Change. So I'm going to give you a few qualitative examples of optimising um, the health system, health and wellbeing using uh, health psychology um, and the behaviour change wheel and the COMB. So First of all, I'm going to look in terms of service improvement. So um, working with one of my former PhD candidates, Dr. Erica Cook, um, we were funded by NHS Direct to look at um, low use of certain populations for, um, for the service of NHS Direct and also an overuse um, within certain groups of um, A&E. And this was a large body of research, but, but one um, project I just want to mention to you was looking at um, 81 individuals, um, high proportion of those were female, uh, through nine focus groups, where we asked them about barriers and facilitators to using NHS Direct, and we interviewed people who were users and non-users. And five themes came out, first an awareness of the service, costs to the individuals, an ease of use and the time and speed to get that medical um, support, and acceptability of non-face-to-face -face healthcare. And, I haven't got time to go into each of these um, projects into too much detail, but some key points that really stood out for me for this project was around um, that kind of cost to the individual to be able to engage. And actually, when we were talking with individuals from NHS Direct, they're not being aware um, initially of that cost. So one of our um, respondents said, you know, if you're really poor and you've got a mobile phone and you've got no credit, then you can't ring NHS Direct, but you can ring 999 and get an ambulance to you for free. And so um, this helped to provide evidence where um, the NHS Direct phone number moved from the 0845 number, which was charged at a local rate if you had a landline, but actually it was a lot higher if you had a mobile phone um, to the new uh, 111 service. Another example, looking at training and tool development. Um, this is an NIHR programme grant that we've got at the moment, uh, and it's led by consultant Andreas Roprish at um, uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital. And here they're um, seeing high uh, levels of either missed or inappropriate referrals um, to surgery for um, developmental dysplasia of the hip. And this is where you're looking at the uh, clicky hip at a six week baby check. And um, we interviewed 17 GPs, again, a high proportion of these were female. And we did inductive analysis, but then we did deductive analysis afterwards using our combi approach. And what we found was that um, there was a disparity in the knowledge of the evidence-based criteria. There's two different assessments to be done uh, in this process and also um, skill in terms of identifying um, this clicky hip. Um, there was also um, at times difficulties with opportunity. So the physical opportunity in terms, of, in terms of clinical time or space and the social norms in practice. And so, and also there was, um, to some extent, um, a lack of confidence when um, knowing whether to refer or not. And so perhaps there were um, some over referrals. And so here we see a GP saying, you know, I've never felt, I've never felt it in real life um, or heard it in real life. I know what I'm feeling for, but I've never felt it or heard it. And the closest thing I felt is like a dislocated hip in A&E, in adult A&E. And then another says, you know, the baby checks uh, we used to have to do in 10 minutes. I've asked, you know, if we can have it in 15 or 20 minutes. Sometimes I get 20, sometimes I don't. And then it eats into the rest of the clinic time. So, again, we're using this qualitative data to help to um, develop a, a diagnostic tool to be able to support referrals um, more appropriately. My next example is around um, 
developing the occupational health um, services. Um, we've worked with a number of different um, populations from council workers to university staff to police staff who all have high levels of um, occupational sitting. And a problem in this group is around um, elevated uh, risk for cardiovascular disease, so high levels of obesity, hypertension, stress. And here we did interviews um, for this particular project, which was led by um, another of my PhD students, uh, who's now graduated, uh, Dr. Marsha Brelli, and an MSc by research student, um, James Yates. And we interviewed um, 10 uh, police staff. And again, they told us that um, their work tasks are seated. It's normal, it's a social norm to sit. They had um, a lack of an ability in their, uh, ability to regulate their behaviour, so sometimes they would forget to stand. Um, some knowledge of health risks was there, but they felt that they lacked organisational organizational support to move around whilst working. They were worried about an impact on productivity, and they had this lack of perceived autonomy to um, reduce their sitting. So we took these themes and we did a, induct, a, a deductive uh, combi analysis, and highlighted where we needed to develop intervention. So awareness of people's own sitting, the impact it's having on their health and changing their physical environment and that social culture to sit and also overcoming that habit um, of sitting too much. So we developed an intervention called the arrest intervention, which had significant improvements in sitting time, but also in those CVD risk factors. And then another example around um, the other end of the intervention development phase, the, the, the evaluation side. Um, I've been involved for a number of years for, on a programme called Active Hearts. And the Active Hearts programme is um, a cardiovascular disease and mental health, um, a programme for people at risk of cardiovascular disease and mental health and for people who are inactive. So it's looking at improving physical activity levels. And we've reached um, over 3000 people through this program and have shown significant elevation in physical activity. And this example is based on a process evaluation um, which included 61 people who were either interviewed or part of focus groups. And we wanted to understand the success of the program and, and how it worked. And so we heard that um, one positive was engagement with primary care. Um, tailored uh, exercise classes that were personalised to people who were coming through the door, the training in behaviour change for the Get Active specialists who were delivering this programme on the ground, conversation cafes that we have created so people could have a cup of tea and a chat um, after their um, physical activity, and the way in which we developed our recruitment material. And so we heard, um, you know, uh, one of our lead employers say, for example, you know, I think a lot of the time with NHS staff, especially clinicians, you really do have to kind of prove yourself. And the Get Out to Specialist has done that. He's proved to be reliable, knowledgeable, trustworthy, and it's really reaped dividends in terms of the kind of partnership between the camps of the NHS. So this was a project that was initially funded through Sport England and the local CCGs, and we're now um, replicating this programme in different areas. So I've also used qualitative research to help to develop health psychology, identity, career opportunities and networks. One of the most favourite pieces of qualitative research I've done is the all history of health psychology in the UK. We received some funding, uh, some funding from the Royal Society led by my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Francis Quinn, and I worked with Val Morrison and um, Tony Cassidy to interview 53 founding members of um, UK health psychology. And what we heard was um, the history of how this discipline developed, but also where we might have missed a trick or where we want to go for future direction. What we heard was that health psychology was developed through disciplines and other disciplines need. The medical profession wanted to understand low uptake of health services or poor adherence to treatment advice or better preparation for surgery or how to enhance doctor patient communication skills. And public health wanted to understand behaviour linked to health concerns. So condom use linked to HIV and AIDS or smoking linked to lung cancer and CVD or diet, exercise and alcohol linked to obesity and diabetes. And so what we know is the goals of health psychology and um, areas such as public health are aligned. We want to improve and save lives. 
but the identity of health psychology um, needed to be strengthened. And in our interviews, we heard that we need to show what this discipline can bring to the table of public health. So we had this opportunity to develop a shared agenda, shared language, uh, evidence of best practice to facilitate future funding, research, implementation and evaluation, and to support clearer uh, training and career opportunities. And so we've done this in part by um, using a hashtag in our social media. So day in the life of health psychology, this is health psychology to promote what we're doing and ask our members to do the same. Uh, in 2014, we developed a network that brought together health psychology and public health um, professionals. Um, it was seed funded with £10,000 from the Director of Public Health in Hertfordshire, Professor Jim McManus. And it aimed to link academia, practice, elected members and public health agencies such as PHE together. We had honorary fellows who were senior champions in the two areas of public health and health psychology. And we offered networking opportunities, shared best practice, conferences and CPD events to support that career development and job opportunity. We helped uh, to help us to facilitate the reach and the impact of the network. We created a journal style publication so that everyone could be connected in the, the kind of way in which we can bring these disciplines together alongside um, a podcast, um, which is being led by Stuart King. And we travelled across the country to um, connect people within health psychology and public health together. In 2017, we held a webinar in PHE where we um, uh, distributed to key stakeholders how to apply health psychology and behavioural science, which is a wider umbrella of sciences, and how um, behavioural experts can be used to analyse literature, uh, develop qualitative uh, insight, advise on policy, design interventions, test them, and train people through CPD events. This led to a strategy being developed and launched in 2018 um, on behavioural and social sciences and how they can be used to improve population health and wellbeing in England. And we, at this point, rebranded this network to become the Behavioural Science and Public Health Network to host uh, the, this strategy and to support the implementation of it. It had a focus on prevention and on building capacity, and we linked this to national agendas such as prevention is better than cure. So the health system wanted health psychologists, but there was a disconnect between the funded training opportunities and career pathways in applied health psychology. We had a highly, well, we have a highly skilled uh, workforce, and many of them work within qualitative methodologies and mixed methods um, research but there's no career direct, um, a clear career pathways. On the other hand, commissioners and public health leads have the power to embed health psychology across the whole of the health and social care system, but they don't know what they don't know about what health psychology can do and qualitative researchers can do and how that can support system change and health and wellbeing goals. On the flip side, our graduates from health psychology tell us that employers have a limited understanding of um, health psychologist skills and that there are equality, diversity and inclusion issues in that while there's no funded training routes available, people are really finding it hard to access a career in this area. So to support that from 2019 to, um, to uh, last year, um, I was the chair of the British um, Psychological Society Division of Health Psychology Member Network. And as part of um, my role as chair, um, we, I, I helped the committee to uh, build identity within health psychology. And one way we've done that is creating a health psychology career case study uh, pack, which showcases 64 individual careers uh, within health psychology, many of these using qualitative and mixed research methods. We also developed a briefing paper for a call to action for investment in behavioural science and in health psychology. And we shared that with um, key stakeholders such as all party parliamentary groups and local authorities. We've also, because then people were saying, well, we really want one of these uh, health psychologists, how do we get them? We've developed a recruitment support pack. And this pack is full of job descriptions and person specifications of what it would look like to employ someone with this level of expertise. And we've used this to generate buy-in. 
And happily, we've secured national funding from uh, four health psychology training uh, places and pathfinders through Health Education England and through local authorities, predominantly for workforce development to help others to be able to use our skills in practice, while also um, uh, the people who are in these roles generating qualitative evidence um, to support system development. And we've also seen a growth in senior roles within this area. And there's a really great tweet from um, Dr. Adrian Whittington, who is the national lead for the Psychological Professions Network, NHS England and um, Health Education England, who said, you know, the work that we've been doing is a great uh, contribution that health psychologists are making to healthcare alongside others um, with expertise in physical healthcare, behaviour change and a biopsychosocial approach. So what I've learned over this time is through the networks I've been involved in, we're stronger together. And if we can raise the voice of people working within different uh, disciplines or different methodological approaches, um, we're more likely to be able to boost careers in this area. So this is a huge uh, team effort. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's been involved in the projects that I've uh, mentioned today. Uh, and I'll just leave you with a call to action about how you'll facilitate um, qualitative and mixed methods careers going forward. Thank you, Angel, for a fantastic overview of all the work that you've been doing, uh, both for your qualitative research, the qualitative research you've done to help develop health psychology careers, and also some of the initiatives that you've developed and have run that have led to really good outputs like strategy documents, portfolios, case studies, recruitment packs, uh, really is a phenomenal amount of work. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I really like um, what you said at the end there about we're stronger together and you've given us all a call to action to think about where we are, whatever, wherever we work, however we are, how can we all support development of qualitative careers and support qualitative researchers and mixed methodologists. So thank you for uh, a fantastic talk. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. So I'll now move over to our final talk. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Catherine Pope, who is Professor in Medical Sociology at the University of Oxford. Um, I won't say much more than that because we are running slightly behind time and I will hand straight over to Catherine. Thank you, Catherine, and welcome. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm gonna try and keep this short uh, uh, and I'm not using slides because there's such a buzz in the Q&A um, and I want to make sure we get time for that. Um, and I want to preface everything by saying thank you to Amy and Angel for sharing their experiences and their careers and their research. It's uh, fantastic to hear all of that. Um, I'm going to start by saying that when Claire uh, invited me to be on this panel, I said, oh, but I'm not a methodologist. You don't want me. Um, and uh, I've been reflecting on that as I've been thinking about giving this uh, talk to you. Um, and it's because I want to be seen as a medical sociologist. And I think some of the reasons for that uh, resonate with things that, that Amy and perhaps also Angel have, have said. Um, and I wanted to start by saying that I distinguish between methods and methodology in as much as I see methods as the tools that we use to collect our data uh, and do analysis. And methodology is an overarching approach. Um, sometimes we call that a paradigm um, that weaves in theoretical stances and those um, philosophical ologies that you get taught about sometimes um, at undergraduate and postgraduate level, ontology and epistemology, how we understand the world and how we think we can know it. And I think here, so far, we've been um, eliding the idea of qualitative methodologist as a shorthand just for a person who uses qualitative methods. Um, so I'm going to try and keep some precision to when I use uh, the term methodology um, to mean things like feminist methodology, interpretive methodology, or a critical methodology, because I do think that that's um, important when we think about the challenges. Um, and reflecting on Amy's uh, talk, um, I think I am often invited to join teams of researchers because of my qualitative expertise. I think I am on a list 
perhaps sadly, as a qualitative methodologist. Um, and that's probably because I've got something of a one hit wonder uh, with my partner in crime, Professor Nick Mays, with a BMJ series and a book that's all about doing qualitative research in health. Um, and that's how I, my career has panned out, I guess, over the last 30 years, is that I've done um, a number of research projects, often mixed methods, where I lead the qualitative component. But the methodologies, that are linked with those qualitative methods often stand in quite a clear conflict or at least in tension with the overarching positivist methodologies that dominate clinical research and trials and biomedical science. And that is a really big challenge for those of us that want to use qualitative methods. And I have made a career of using qualitative methods and mixed methods in health research. Although I trained back in the 80s before some of you were born, I'm no doubt, um, in both methods, qualitative and quantitative. And I do think that that has been incredibly beneficial uh, to me, even though latterly I have tended to use qualitative methods more dominantly in the research that I do. Um, when I began working in health services research, I learned that qualitative methods in particular were not very highly regarded. Um, they're the bottom of the evidence pyramid, as far as I can make out. Um, qualitative methods were described as small scale and anecdotal. Um, the methods and methodology papers and outputs that I produced were described by my colleagues, who I love dearly, as chat pieces. Um, and there was a question um, that Deborah put in the chat, reminding me that we're also referred to as the fuzzy stuff, um, which is never a good look, I think. So um, I spent a huge amount of my early career fighting for qualitative methods to be taken seriously. And if I'm honest with you, I thought we'd kind of won that battle until 30 years after Nick and I first defended qualitative methods in the BMJ, my lovely colleague Trish Greenhow felt compelled to lead yet another letter questioning their editorial policies and their rejection of qualitative papers. So I think that that is still a challenge that we're still fighting for our methods to be taken seriously. But the research projects that I do are about clinical problems or about specific diseases and challenges of service transformation. They're not specifically about methods. The methods that we use are the tools to answer the questions and increasingly qualitative methods are accepted as the right tools to answer some of those questions. And while methodology in the sense of a feminist or an interpretivist paradigm may not be the core or dominant paradigm underpinning many of the projects that I work in, I find that I can smuggle it in. Now, that might be because my family heritage is from the Kent coast in the UK, so I like to think I'm a bit of a pirate. So I really like smuggling in qualitative methods to the projects that I do, mainly because it, they answer the questions that other research methods cannot reach. And Amy has called for better and more sustainable funding, um, and I think that is still important. But I think if you want to, you can be a pirate and you can smuggle qualitative research in. I do mixed and qualitative research, sometimes within trials, that helps answer really important questions. And those questions might be, for example, I've got a current uh, trial that we're doing that is to reconfigure stroke services to support, support thrombectomy surgeries. And for me, that involves watching and talking to clinical teams to understand if and how we can change their clinical practice. And I know that qualitative methods are the key to answering those questions. But I also sometimes get the chance to do qualitative research that is entirely qualitative, often gifted to me by clinicians who bring me those questions. I'll never forget the fabulous Andy Smith, an anaesthetist in Lancaster, who brought me and Maggie Mort and Dawn Goodwin the question, what is anaesthetic expertise? 
And that led to a fantastic ethnographic project studying expert practice in order to try and understand it. And a project that I started yesterday with a fabulous team that involves um, Helen Atherton and Sue Zeebland and a number of other wonderful colleagues is going to do ethnography to understand how we can improve access to general practitioner appointments. So smuggle it in, be a pirate. Qualitative methods explain why. They tell you what's really going on. They help us get inside the heads of patients and clinicians and show how they understand things and why they do the things that they do. They answer questions about what clinicians really do with the new technologies that we keep throwing at them and why innovations do and do not work. It is a challenge to keep demonstrating that qualitative methods are useful, but I think we can do it. Um, there was a thing in the Q&A from Rachel about the fact that that needs time. So I would say steal that time, fight for it, defend it with a cutlass if necessary. And if you really can't get the time to do proper qualitative research, walk away from that project and from that team, because that's not a place that you will thrive. I'm really excited that the incubator might be a pirate collective where we can all get together and network about how we defend our methods and methodologies. The final thing I was asked to talk about is about how you can innovate your qualitative methods. So I think you'll probably know the theme that I'm riffing on here. I'm going to say, find a research question that demands innovation and smuggle that innovation into the research project. Our meta-ethnography work came out of a frustration with doctors saying that qualitative was too small, fuzzy and anecdotal and wouldn't say anything big. So we answered big questions like, why don't patients take their medicines using meta-ethnography as an evidence synthesis method? And other fabulous teams have run with a number of qualitative synthesis methods that are really, really exciting. Another innovation currently uh, on our desks for qualitative research is digital research. COVID has helped us a bit. It's been one of the very few positives in that we've had to pivot to virtual ethnography, virtual interviewing and so on and so forth. And I think we need to identify where we can use those methods to continue to answer questions. So I would say that there are methods and methodological challenges for us, but that qualitative research clearly has a place. We've got the incubator we're often called for in NIHR funded projects. And I suggest that we continue to fight for our space and think about how we can smuggle methods and innovation in. It's tricky, but it is doable and it is possible to be a pirate. And I'll stop there and let us get to the questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, you've given us a clear uh, new identity, I think, as a pirate qualitative researcher. So thank you very much for that really insightful talk and reminding us of the importance of language and uh, thinking about methods and methodology together. So thank you for that really important reminder. Um, I'm going to move straight on, um, just thinking about what our three speakers have, have said, um, and what you've heard from Dawn and myself. Uh, we've got one short poll, uh, which we'd really, it's just one question before we move to the Q&A. If we can launch this poll, please, and just give you a few moments to think uh, if you could give us your view on which of these topic, topics you would like future activity to focus on. Um, and then this will give us an idea about where we prioritise our activity within the next 12 months of time we have left in the incubator. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the only one that can see this or if you can all see this, but we've got nearly 50% uh, interested in the qualitative methodologists as principal investigators, closely followed by getting funding for methodological innovation, careers of critical methodologists, impact, um, and then networking and developing collaborations on 43%. So fantastic, thank you for um, uh, completing that poll. Okay, um, we are slightly running behind time, but we have 15 minutes now for Q&A. Um, thank you for posting the questions in the chat. Um, we probably won't get through all of these, but what we will do is we will write a response to the questions that we can't uh, reply to today. And when the incubator website is up and running, 
we will post a short uh, document with with the uh, with the response in there. So don't worry if you have answered if you are, you have asked a question, uh, we will endeavour to provide a response when our website is up and running. So we've done the upvoting uh, feature, so we can see which questions uh, uh, you want answering, um, which are most common. Um, and the first question um, is around whether the NIHR has a joined up approach to tackling some of these really important issues that uh, you have all raised, um, cultural issues around burnout, around contracts, um, about NIHR workers, uh, researchers doing a lot of work for free, you know, volunteering, we do a lot outside of our, our day job. So um, are there any initiatives that we know of that are moving towards that space in terms of collective approach across the NIHR. If I could go to Dawn first, as, as you may be connected with uh, more than some of the rest of us in terms of NIHR at that level of strategy. Thanks, Claire. Um, yes, I mean, this is a really, really good question. Um, this, this sort of being pulled in all directions um, that we get when, we, when we're seen as sort of being methods experts is, is a real challenge. It's a, such a challenge for career progression. It's such a challenge for workload. And just, so that's one of the reasons that the incubator has been asked to think about these things and make some recommendations to the NIHR. The, um, there is also something called the NIHR Careers Initiative, which is looking exactly at those groups of people that aren't in possession of um, personal awards, you know, so if, you, if you're lucky enough to get a fellowship and a nice long fellowship, you know, you've got some autonomy over how you can do things over that period. But when you're funded, maybe from a variety of projects, like we often are with the NIHR, you have competing deadlines, you're getting stretched very thin. So they, they are looking at it and we are keeping them aware. We'll be feeding back immediately following this webinar today, just that you know, how, how these things are still burning issues for so many researchers. And all I can say is that we keep feeding back this message to them with, with some suggested solutions as well. So we're, we're, we've got ways of um, suggesting how, if they maybe embrace or a bit stronger embrace the Concordat and ensure that people have got spare time to turn to different activities as opposed to having all of your time already more than all of your time sort of being dictated by other other projects that you're you're working on thank you dawn yes you raise a quite an important point there around kind of aligning nihr approaches with our own employers if you if you work in a university for example we have the researcher concord act which gives best practice in supporting and developing careers so there are there are initiatives out there um, and it really is important to see a way that we can align some of these uh, really important challenges and provide recommendations for solutions. Um, is there anybody else on the panel that would like to comment on that? Yes, Catherine, please do come yeah, in. Just very quickly, because I'm on the one of the Academy Fellowship panels um, and I would say we've been making a real effort on the panel to um, do the job security piece for people applying for fellowships in pushing back on departmental uh, letters of support that do not say that there will be a job for this person at the end of a fellowship. Um, and so we are doing that as a panel. Um, and I know that that is the NIHR's expectation um, but also I think fellowship uh, applicants should know that that is what they should ask for. They should say, if I get this fellowship from NIHR, it's very prestigious, it's a lot of money, it pays my salary, the least you could do is give me an open-ended contract. Yeah, thank you. And I know some of the NIHR infrastructures that I'm more closely involved with, for example, um, the School for Primary Care Research, has in the past had um, opportunities for bridging money. So they have that uh, in, uh, in the awards that they get as an infrastructure. So there are opportunities to seed core money, bridging money that kind of overcome the problem of having fixed term contracts. Um, so those are, those are some of the potential opportunities within the NIHR. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next question that's been, uh, had lots of thumbs uh, to, to mark it up. So how, this is a question about how do we crack the issue that lots of people uh, lots of people in roles with um, with expertise 
mean that they would work effectively together, find it difficult to connect the hard to reach problem. I'm a clinical academic and qualitative methodologist. I'd love to collaborate with other researchers by linking up, staying, uh, funding together. Found it really hard to do in practice. So I guess this is a question about connecting, collaborating, providing people to work with you in your area of interest. I can see heads nodding. Amy, would you like to come in first there? It's funny actually, because um, I met Sarah at a conference and it was because of her amazing presentation that I got in touch with her and said, mm -hmm. I want to talk more about your research. So, I mean, there are methods by which we are networking, but again, you need the space and the time to work through those conversations and to actually join up. And I think it's the same with the bridging funding. It, we need shared networking of awareness because some people are in the chat are saying, what is this bridging funding? I've never been told about it. So there is a question of when there's multiple places out there that we could meet and we could network, having one central space when we're all people interested in NHR funding would be better than trying to fish around in different groups. We could spend a lot of our time kind of connecting rather than chasing contacts. But I do think that facilitated networking is also important. Placing our pins on the map is one thing, but really understanding who we are and what we can contribute is a bit more complex than that and I think that needs to be facilitated by something like this group. Thank you I can see Angel nodding so I'll bring you in there Angel for any further comment on that important point. Yeah I agree if we can facilitate that networking it's really important because certainly for the stuff we've done in health psychology and public health, we've been able to facilitate networking both within um, a, a, an online environment, so either a website or an open science framework area where we can share things of, you know, and people can get involved that way. But also we host um, monthly conversation cafes, which are, you know, we share links to, um, it, it's just a Zoom room, but people come on a regular basis um, from across um, the UK where they can share the same problems, the same challenges, but also how they're overcoming them, solutions, et cetera. And I think the more we can um, enable that, the more people are gonna be able to, um, to, you know, to work with each other. And I think the other thing that we've certainly seen a shift from during COVID, we've done quite a lot of work on COVID uh, recently, is seeing bigger teams. So seeing people working together rather than working, you know, in silos or, or, you know, not with each other. And I think, you know, where we can, if we can promote that, that kind of brings everyone forward together rather than kind of pockets of people working probably on fairly similar things, but, um, you know, almost in competition with each other. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Really helpful replies. Thank you. I'll just explain what I meant by the bridging funding for people that um, weren't aware of this. So th there are opportunities for bridging funding, for example, the School for Primary Care Research, which is an organisation that I'm linked into because I work at Keele University in the medical school. There are nine departments that are in the School for Primary Care Research. And as part of that initiative, the, um, the organisation has money to allocate as bridging money. Um, so it, it's within that infrastructure that bridging money is available in that context. OK, I'll just go on to the next question, which I can quickly reply to. Um, so Sarah has said um, that she feels that everybody in the call might be happy to help solve the problems that, that we're talking about today. What's the best way to do it? Can the uh, feedback form um, give details, give permission to share details? Well, in the evaluation form, you can give your um, email address. Please do give that because then that enables us to contact you and you can sign up to come to join discussions in the work stream. So you can sign up to the work stream. We can get in touch with you and then you can be part of those conversations. OK, so the next question is about uh, how it's challenging to present oneself as a qualitative researcher in health service environments. How do we explain our methods simply in healthcare settings? Take that, Catherine. Thank I'll you. Just, I'll give my pirate answer, which is actually <laughs> don't don't explain show um, because actually the value is in showing what our methods illuminate and reveal and the stuff that you cannot get any other way. Thank you. Really, really great answer. Thank you. I'm going uh, to the next question here, which is I find it really outstanding, um, astounding, sorry, that qualitative methodology is still having to be smuggled. Um, how, given um, it's been a battle, it's been ongoing for years, how do we change the culture? 
of those that think it's the fuzzy stuff. I'll start with Catherine again, uh, and then I'll Sorry. move. Sorry, probably through. because I went last. Um, I think we just have to keep going. This is like, how do you get an anti-racist practice world? Uh, you know, we are not we are not there yet. We just have to keep going. You just have to keep doing it. We have to keep fighting it. Every now and again, we have to get Trish to write another letter to the BMJ. You know, we just have to do it. And um, I think that's all we can do. And, but I, you know, I would say it has got much better, almost to the point that I was joking with a colleague um, that uh, many research projects now, um, and certainly the discussions in funding panels are, oh, this needs a qualitative arm, doesn't it? Or this needs a qualitative work package. So I think there are more spaces and it's, uh, you know, there are still challenges, but maybe it's not as bad as the bad old days. Thank you. Um, Amy, uh, do you want to come in around how we, how do we, how do we uh, change the perception that we're, it's the fuzzy stuff? I think the esteem follows the money. If we fund it and we fund high quality sources of qualitative research, then people will recognise that. Same with Athena Swan, the minute it was linked to funding, everybody started to take it seriously and, um, and started to actually see it as a recognised problem that needed addressing. And I think the NIHR has a role to play here because it can show the value of qualitative research by funding it and then everybody will start to really think about qualitative research. Same with PPI, now it's asked for in applications, people take it much more seriously. Thank you. Um, Angel, I can see you nodding. Is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think the other thing to consider is impact and how we can hi highlight qualitative research and how it leads to um, those impact um, elements that are often asked for in REF um, submissions, for example. So I think if we've got the funding, also we show the quality through um, impact. Thank you. Yeah, really important. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more minutes. Um, I'll just take two more questions. Um, there's a question about ethics and it, uh, is, is ethics getting in the way? Um, what do we think about that? Is there a problem with ethics? A Amy, you, your work is um, linked My to consent. Is sitting on it? ethics panels yes. at the moment. Yes, yes. You, um, yeah, please do comment on this. Ethics, uh, I mean, at the HRA, ethics panel members are volunteers. And so if qualitative people don't volunteer, there is not that expertise in the same way on a panel. The panel might be more cautious and, um, and might not understand what people are getting at, especially I've seen requests to submit an interview structure and then what the outcome will look like, what the workshop after that will look like. And you know all of these things can't be worked on as part of what people produce which I think is problematic and that means we do need expert members on ethics panels and I've also seen some amazing people who really understand it so it does depend who you get um, but you're asking people to volunteer their time again and that means usually the same people who champion these causes end up doing that so we do have an issue that they are that qualitative work is held up to the same standards as clinical trials to some degree, and yet we can't accept uncertainty in ethics because of the way the process is designed. So I think there is a question there, and I know the HRA are interested in this. So there's also a time to be commenting and bringing this to them. Thank you. Very timely. Thank you. I'll just take one final um, question because it, it might be relevant to a few people on the call. Um, questions just jumping around oh no it's just gone it was about opportunities um about opportunities for people who um might have non-traditional roots who, who want to don't have qualitative expertise um either want to do a phd or um develop their skills what funding opportunities are there for uh, people who want to develop skills in qualitative research and qualitative methodology the, i know the nihr used to have a fellowship which was called the trans, trans, transitional, trans, transitional fellowships, that's what they were called, where you could transition from one area to the other. Now, I don't think that fellowship's in existence anymore, but that would have been the kind of opportunity that would be available. Don't think that's in existence anymore. Are the panel members aware of uh, any other opportunities like that? 
Yeah, Angel, thank you. Not specifically like that, but I know the MRC and um, Public Health Intervention Development Scheme welcomes qualitative research, certainly from that kind of early needs assessment of developing an intervention stage. We've had a couple of those grants and, and it's been in you know interviews and focus groups. It's um, been, been funded really well. Thank you. Anybody else on the call, on the panel? No? Okay, well, I'm aware of time. We're now on to uh, the end of the um, webinar. I would like to thank our speakers for fantastic talks. Um, they've been really insightful and helpful in giving us some uh, insights into qualitative and mixed methodologists careers, some of the challenges you face, but also you've given us inspiration, you've given us a call to action, you've given us a, a, a reason to challenge what's happening and ideas of how we can maybe make changes uh, in our area of expertise. Um, you can um, complete the uh, post evaluation form, that would be really helpful. It's been in, I think it's been posted in the chat, you will get that after you leave this webinar. Please tell us about what your career development needs are and what you would like our work stream to focus on in the next 12 months. I'd also like to thank the NIHR team uh, for helping with this webinar and for um, Dawn as well for um, coming to join us today as chair of the Methodology Incubator. One final thank you. Thank you to the panel and thank you to everybody on the call who's been very engaging in the chat. We will um, put a response to the questions we haven't been able to answer um, on our website when it is available. Thank you very much for joining today. Goodbye. <laughs>